you go over to Texas and start south, you go on down to the very tip of the United States of America. You come in uh, to Texas there to the town of Brownsville. When Alice and I were working with Operation Mobilization some years ago, we lived for a time in Brownsville. <coughs> From Brownsville, you can take a bridge across to the town of Matamoros. And you get over in Matamoros, you're in Mexico. The climate is, of course, not much different. If it's raining in Brownsville, it's probably raining in Matamoros. A little bit of difference. You ride around and you see the signs for fast food in Brownsville that advertises fried chicken. You get over in Matamoros, there's polo. <laughs> but there's a whole lot of things that are the same. But there's a big difference. You're in Mexico. You're not in the United States of America anymore. And a lot of the blessings and privileges which belong to the people in the United States don't belong to the people in Mexico. And that's why so many Mexicans are trying to get across the border and get into the United States. Mexico, Mexico is not all that bad, but Mexico is borderland. And there are a lot of differences in borderland to be considered. Back in the ancient times, borderland was a dangerous choice. If you have a, Bible, uh, a map in the Bible of, that you use in the back, you may see a map of the land of the Israelites. And you see that land coming down here, and over on this side is what Moses called the land of Canaan. And you come to the Jordan River. And on the other side, well, it's the land east of the Jordan. Did Israelites live over there? Well, on some of the maps you'll see Gad, Manasseh, Reuben, those are three of the Israelite tribes. But on the other side of the Jordan River, you see all the rest of the tribal names. The Jordan River was a dividing line. And the people who were living over on the east side Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh were living in borderland. That is not part of the land that God planned for the Israelites. When God was going to show Moses the promised land, he took him up on Mount Nebo, which is located east of the Jordan. And he had him look across the Jordan to the land of Canaan. And he told him, you're not going to get to enter into that land. And that's another story we won't get into. 
But you see, there was a definite difference between the land east of the Jordan and the land west of the Jordan. In the book of 1 Chronicles, in chapter 5, we read what finally happened to the people who were over there on the east side of the Jordan in borderland. It says, And they transgressed against the God of their fathers and played the harlot with the gods of the people of the land whom God destroyed before them. And the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, king of Assyria, and the spirit of Tiglath-Pernizer, king of Assyria, and he carried them away. He brought them these other lands that are mentioned. And it says, unto this day, they were carried away. Now there's a lesson in this situation for the people who lived in borderland. Let's go back into the scripture and see just exactly what happened. You see, this story happened after the 40 years of wandering of the Israelites in the wilderness. And they approached the Promised Land on the east side of the Jordan River. That was a much shorter trip from Egypt right on up into the land of Canaan, but the 40 years of wandering took them all around in this area. Now they've come up on the east side of the Jordan and get ready to look to move into the promised land. Well, there was a proposition of two and a half tribes of the Israelites, and that's recorded for us in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 32. It says, Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, and behold, this place was a place for cattle. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spoke unto Moses, the Elias and the priests, and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, Adaroth, and Dibon, and Jazer, and Deborah, and Heshbon, and Aiah, and Sebum, and Nebo, and Biron, even to the country which the Lord uh, smote before the congregation of Israel as a land of cattle. And thy servants have cattle. Wherefore, said they, if we found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over the Jordan. There's their proposition. They've come all the way up from the wilderness, and they've been living in this land over here on the east of the Jordan, and now these folks say, let us live over here. It wasn't part of the promised land. It wasn't part of the land that it, God had, had in mind for them to settle in. But they said, let us have this land over here. 
on the east side of the Jordan. Borderland. They said that's where we want to live. Well, of course, there was an objection to that. Moses said, oh, wait a minute. You want to stay over here? And now your brethren are going to have to cross the Jordan River and are going to have to fight for this land over here in the land of Canaan? And the people from Gad and Reuben, the half tribe of Manasseh, said, Well, but we have a lot of soldiers, a lot of armed men among us. And we will promise that when the rest of the Israelites cross over the Jordan River, our fighting men will go with them. And we will fight with the others over here till all this land is conquered. And so Moses said, well, all right, if you promise that when the time comes you cross over with the rest of us and you will fight with us, then you can have for your inheritance this land over here on the east side of the Jordan, the border, the border land. Well, uh, what did the uh, people of Gad and Asher and Again, Reuben and the half tribe of Manasseh, what did they do? Well, the scripture tells us about uh, some of their conduct. Back over in the fifth chapter of uh, First Chronicles again. <clears throat> says, the sons of Reuben, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, of the valiant men, able to bear shield and sword, and to shoot with a bow, and skillful with, in war, were four and forty thousand, seven hundred and three score, who went out to the war. So they're keeping their promise. Crossed over the Jordan, and they're helping to fight. And they made war with the Hagrites and Jinners and Nephish and Nodad. And they were helped against them, and the Hagrites were delivered into their hand, all of whom were with them. For they cried unto God in the battle, and he was entreated of them, because they put their trust in him. Oh, that sounds pretty good. They're helping in the wars over here on the west side. They prayed to God to help them. And God heard their prayer and gave them victory in what we're doing. The scripture says in verse 18, they went out. So this was a conscious decision on the heart right of, of these people. And they backed up their decision with action. They crossed the river and they went to fighting. They made war, the scripture says. They just didn't think about helping the other Israelites. They pitched in and helped them. And they were helped by God in what they did. The enemy was delivered into their hand. Well, that all sounds good for these folks of the tribe of Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh. But what was the end? Well, we read about that. The Assyrians came.
because these folks over here had departed from the worship of God. And they'd taken up the idolatry of the Canaanites that lived over here on the east side. And when the Assyrians came up against the Israelites, where did they attack? On the east side of the Jordan. And that's what the scripture said. <coughs> These people were conquered by the Assyrians and carried away into Assyria. And that's the last we hear of. Then the Assyrians were pretty violent people in war. Archaeologists have dug up some of the sculptures and stone carvings left behind by the Assyrians, recording their warfare. How did they treat the people that they conquered? The scripture says that if they found pregnant women, in effect they'd say, oh, you're going to have a baby. Well, let's have it right now. They take a knife and split her open. Little children running around in the conquered land. What would they do with little children? They'd take a little child up and grab him by the feet and swing him around and then bang! Into a stone wall. Dashing his brain child. And for the other folks, well, they'd bind them together with chains and march them off to a different land. Some of you will remember during World War II, some of the conduct of the Japanese soldiers. You remember the Death March of Bataan, where the Japanese, having gotten a victory over a lot of our soldiers, lined them up and marched them away to a different area. It was called a Death March. because it was so difficult and demanding that many of the American soldiers died on the way. How did they die? Well, if a man became so weak, so emaciated, that he couldn't go any further, and he'd fall out, The Japanese soldiers. Oh, you can't go any further? Yeah, you can't go any further. Bang, bang, bang! That's why a lot of the other, other soldiers, as best they could, when a man became so weak he couldn't go any further, they'd grab hold of him and, and drag him along and carry him because there wasn't any alternative to death. Well, that's what the Assyrians were like. <clears throat> that's the way they treated these people who had 
decided they wanted to live in the borderland. Well, now, what are some lessons that we can get from this? Well, first of all, these people chose what suited them. Jeremiah 17, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. When people go according to what their own desires are, what their own heart tells them to do, what is going to happen? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and how are you going to end up? Well, the heart of these people was deceitful. They looked at the countryside and they said, hey, this would be a good place for us to live. That's what they chose. And look what happened to them. First they departed from the Lord, and they were conquered and carried away into the Assyrian captivity. That's you and me apart from the control of God. Oh, if we don't choose to let Him have His way, and we choose to have our way, we're in for trouble. If we hang back from total commitment to God and choose what suits us, we're going to be in trouble. These people chose what we might call the broad land. If you look at the map, you see that this land over here on the west side of the Jordan, the promised land, is only about 60 miles wide between Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. It's a pretty narrow land. You go over on the other side, on the east side, and the land just goes on and on and on into Arabia. Miles and miles and miles and miles. That's the broad land. You know where Jesus said there's two ways. There's the broad way and the narrow way. In the old King James Version it says there's a broad gate that leads to the broad way. Scholars have determined that that little phrase, broad gate, was not in the original text. Somebody down the line and copying put that in there. Because it says there's a narrow gate that leads to life. And they thought, well, there ought to be a broad gate then. But the scripture actually said there's a broad way that leads to destruction and a narrow gate that leads to life. Why isn't there a broad gate? Because you don't need a gate to get on the broad way. You're already out. And you go on it, and on it, and on it, and it leads into destruction. The choice that needs to be made is to go through the narrow 
gate. That's what leads to the narrow road. And that's the road of life. We need to let God set the limits for us. Oh, if we're turned loose to choose our own way, like those Reubenites and Gadites and half tribe of Manasseh, you get the broad land. And what happened to them? You let God lead you, and you get into the promised land on the other side of the Jordan River. The Christian life is a fenced-in life. If you're a Christian, there are places you don't go, the things you don't do. Thank God it's that way, because we haven't got enough sense to choose what's right unless we take God's guidance. Our hearts, as we read, were desperately wicked. And we're going to choose the wrong way every time. Unless we make up our minds that we're going to take that narrow way. Yeah, there are things you don't do and places you don't go if you're a Christian. It's a narrow life. Because it's a life that God wants us to have. Well, the other Israelites over on the west side of the Jordan River recognized there was a difference, finally, among these people over on the east side. <coughs> In the book of Joshua, it tells us about how those people over in the land of Canaan recognized the difference. And their representatives came over to the other folks on the wrong side of Jordan. And in effect, they said, what's going on over here? You folks really going to be separated from us? Oh no, they said, we're not going to be separated. Well, the other folks said, what's this great big altar for that you built between us and you? You're going to be starting to worship other gods? You're going to be changing your laws, your regulations. No, 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 no. That, that altar, uh, that represents the unity that's supposed to be between us. We just like you. Would you see those folks over on the right side of the Jordan? They know the difference. Those folks over in the borderland, they thought that nobody would see any difference in them. But people did. And they do that today. If you're living a worldly life, you think the other folks in the church don't know it? Oh, you say, I'm just like you. Don't kid yourself. They can tell the difference. They can tell whether you're putting God first in your life. They can tell whether you're really concerned and interested about the things of the church. Or whether you're just kind of hanging on the border man. Well, we 
we have to conclude that these people, I guess, made a natural choice. Natural choice. Borderland allows uh, freedom. You can do a lot of things if you live in borderland that you can't do over in the land of Canaan. Kind of that way in the church, isn't it? In 1 Corinthians, third chapter, the apostle writes to those Corinthian Christians and says, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual because you're carnal. Oh, there's two kinds of Christians. There's the ones living in the borderland and the ones living in the promised land. Now those folks at Corinth were Christians. They'd all said they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They'd all been baptized and they were going to church regularly. Having the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Paul says they're carnal. What does that mean? Well, carnal means fleshly. In other words, he said, you all are doing just what feels good to you. Oh, you've got your church activities and you've got your Christianity. He says, I can't even talk to you as if you were spiritual because you're carnal. You're living in borderland. And you just can't even receive the message of God like you should. I guess we'd have to say that living in borderland shows a lack of love for God. You remember among the Israelites they had that Ark of the Covenant? Had those cherubs on top of it and God says, I will dwell with you between the cherubs on top of that ark. That ark was going across the Jordan River. And what did that indicate? It indicated that God was going across to the west side. And these folks over here, Ruth and Gad, the half and half of the Nassau said, Okay, God can go over on the other side. We're going to live on this side. They didn't want to be as close to God as they could be. No, we'll just stay over here. Or it's that way sometimes with people. Everything was saying back in those days, cross over, get over into the promised land. But they didn't go. Where was the cross of Jesus Christ located? Where did Jesus die for our sins? Over on that side. All these folks over here, they. Eh? They didn't want to be close to the place where Jesus died. Borderland. Oh, beloved, are we trying to get as close to Jesus as we can? 
Are we living on the other side of Jordan? Check over your list of activities during a week and see whether they indicate that you're trying to live close to Jesus or whether you don't care. Well, the choice shows really a lack of concern about the danger. If those folks over there on the borderlands could have just known what was ahead and what was going to happen when those Assyrians came in, <laughs> Boy, they just carried across that Jordan River quick enough. But they didn't know what was ahead. They just went according to what felt good. You know, if we settle for the borderland, we do it because we underestimate the enemy. They underestimated what those Assyrians could do. What about us? Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual host of wickedness. What'd you say? He's saying there is a spiritual world, as it were. Now, we're ready to admit, well, there's God, and there's Jesus, and there's the Holy Spirit, and there's all the angels, but what about the devil and his crowd? Paul says, that's the ones we're fighting against. We're not fighting against rest and flesh and blood, we're fighting against spiritual hopes and wickedness. Do you think what you've got is enough to stand against them? You think your own strength is enough to fight against the devil's crowd? Well, you may think so, but it's not enough. And sometimes, you know, we we overestimate our own strength. We think, well, look how far, how far I've come. I've confessed Jesus, and I've been baptized, and I'm a church member, and I go to church every Sunday. Isn't that enough? Well, uh, those Israelites, Reuben Gad and that tribe of Manasseh, they won some victories, hadn't they? They were wrong about it. There were times when they cried out to the Lord and the Lord gave them victory. But those times were in the past. They've gone back, they've gone back to the borderland home. We don't read any record of God giving victory over there. No, what do we read about? We read about how they took up with the idol worship of the native people. And they slipped back away from God. That'll well, happen to us. If we're depending on a first experience of maybe some victories in life over sin and Satan, and we in effect say, well, I've got it made. Don't need to worry much anymore. Don't need to read so much in the Bible. Don't need to do so much praying. And maybe I can start skipping a few church services and well, that's the way it goes. Heading for trouble. Well, as we 
you see it in some of these people over on the east side, those over in borderland, they got what they asked for. That's the dreadful truth of the freedom of choice that God has given to us. Oh, brothers and sisters, we're going to get what we ask for. If we ask for a life in the borderland, we're going to get it. Just like a tribe of Reuben and Gad and half tribe of Manasseh. If we ask for a life in the land of Canaan, we can get that. Because you look carefully and you find that over here, among the tribes that are listed, you'll find Manasseh. Because remember, the ones on the wrong side of the Jordan River were Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh. There were some of those folks in the tribe of Manasseh who said, uh-uh, not us. We're going to cross the Jordan River. We're going to get over there on the right side. Some of them want to stay over here. Half the tribe stay over here. Yeah, you can stay there if that's what you want. But we want to be over here with the other Israelites. We want to be over here on the right side of the River Jordan. We want to be in the promised land. You get what you choose. And when the Syrians came in and they carried away that half the tribe of Anasta, the other half didn't go. Because they weren't living in the borderland. Oh, how's it going to be one of these days when the Lord returns? Some folks are going to be caught up to be with him. And there's going to be some folks that are left behind. You remember one of the most popular novel series, Christian novels, that's ever been written? <coughs> was the Left Behind series. And it undertakes to try to describe what's going to happen when the Lord calls his own up to be with him and their folks left behind. You ought to be on the side of those who are with the Lord Jesus. Or you want to be left behind. Oh, I guess the borderline folks. But again, everything, given everything in the world, eventually, if they made the right choice. But they decided they wanted to live in the borderland. And it was a terrible decision. You can't live in the borderland forever. The Assyrians are coming. <laughs> the way it was with those Israelites long ago. You need to get over on the other side. Live with the people of God. Make the 
right choices. Put Jesus first in your life. Don't live in the borderland. Ralph said later on, many years later, the cross of Jesus was located not in the borderland, but in the promised land. And it's kind of that way I guess today. The cross of Jesus is on one side, and there's a borderland on the other side, and you need to make a choice of which side you're going to be on. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. What kind of life you're living? What kind of choices are you making? You're trying to live in borderland? Over on the side where the, where the cross is. Oh, there's a cross, Jesus said, for you over there on his side. And you've got to take your cross and follow him. If you're willing to do that. If there's a decision you need to make this morning, rededicate your life to the Lord, decide to move over across the Jordan River, or maybe you need to make a rededication. Say, I realize I've been living on the wrong side. I've been living in borderland. And I want to get over on the right side, near the cross. I must need to go home by the way of the cross. If you need to come forward and make a decision known public, why well, do that? I will stand and sing together. First and last verse.